John Mark, my friend, thank you so much for being with me and contributing to this conversation. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm so excited to talk with you about uh, contemplative prayer, silence and solitude, or what I call in my book, Be Still and Know. Uh, I know that this is a practice that's near and dear to your heart as it is to mine. We've been able to have many conversations about this that no one has heard. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's nice to have one that, that some will hear. So I, I want to get into the practice of silence or silence and prayer. Um, and I want to end on all the how-to and everything, yeah. but, but let's start with where does this originate? Because most people that I imagine listen to this will emerge from traditions who have been given the idea that praying is talking. It's a very active thing. It is talking to God. And, and it is that, but it's something much more broad than that. So can we start just with the history? Where does the idea of silence as a spiritual practice come from? Well, I mean, obviously in the life of Jesus, you see this undulating rhythm and kind of back and forth between time and the Greek word is the eremos, which yeah. is sometimes translated the desert, but it's not necessarily a desert like sand and no trees. It can be translated the wilderness, the wild place. Some translations in the NIV are the lonely place or the quiet place is actually mm -hmm. one translation of this kind of Greek word eremos. And so you regularly see Jesus sneaking away to the Ramos, the desert place, the wild place, the lonely place, the quiet place, the solitary place, all valid translations. And then coming back to deep webbing of community. And I think prayer tends to operate like much of the spiritual life best in full solitude and deep community. Mm -hmm. But sadly, many of us spend our spiritual life in like middling social settings, yeah. which is almost like you're not getting either end of the deep end of the pool, you mm -hmm. know? And Jesus seems to go really deep on both sides. And, you know, you of course you have the Luke line, Jesus often, this is Luke 5, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Yeah. And so for Jesus, solitude, and you see that kind of a, in Luke's formula there, lonely place, or it's a Ramos, desert place, and prayed these things go together. So solitude and prayer are kind of two sides of the same coin. Solitude is where not all prayer, but a very specific type of prayer is done. And of course you have all the stories about Jesus praying all night on the mountainside and they're silent, ironically, as to what was happening in that moment. I think I always assumed, because I grew up in a tradition where prayer meant asking God to do things in the world. Right. And that is a dimension of prayer, but I think I grew up in a tradition where that was the whole dimension the only of prayer. Dimension, yeah. yeah. And obviously it's a beautiful, biblical, and crucial aspect of prayer. But more and more, I highly doubt that Jesus was, maybe he was, but all night long up asking God to do things in the world. And you wonder, there's that one story where after an all night prayer session, then he called his disciples to him and chose those he himself wanted. Mm -hmm. So something was happening in that night that was discernment, getting in touch with his desire, with getting in touch with God's purposes through his life, something yeah, else some kind maybe. Of deep listening. Something there was happening that was maybe much closer to listening than to talking. And I just think listening is at the heart of prayer and at the heart of discipleship. And listening is done in the quiet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, if, if something I've noticed is that if you look at the saints throughout history, like people whose lives have really made a significant mark for the kingdom, who have been shaped and, and formed in the way of Jesus in a way that others took notice of in a remarkable way, they are always people who seemed to be still internally yeah. even those who were, were activists externally yes. extroverted activist yeah. kind of people yes there, there's this deep inner quiet and unhurry and stillness and so i've i've started to think of a quiet inner life being the canvas on which god paints his masterpieces and yet i also live in a world in a culture that does almost nothing to cultivate a quiet inner life within me and almost everything to clutter my inner life. And I have a personality that leans toward yeah, activism, like activism yes. extroversion, everything like that. So I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about 
the way that we're being spiritually formed if we don't intentionally cultivate a practice of silence. Yeah, you know, when you're Henry Nouwen, you can just say things more bluntly than when you're Tyler (laughs) Staten or John Mark Comer. And I just think of his line, you know, quote, without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life, Mm -hmm. end quote. And I don't think I would say it so bluntly because my pastoral hat is on and I'm thinking, well, yeah, but what about the young parent who just had a three month old, has a three month old baby? And what about the person in residency or the person working three jobs or whatever? And so you just are so sensitive pastorally to that, that we shy away from saying what I think Noun was right. Without solitude, it is virtually impossible to have any meaningful life with God. And I would say the same about community. And by community, I don't mean social settings at church. I mean deep webbing of relationships with other followers of Jesus. So I think silence is indispensable. And you're right, it is incredibly hard. And I think human beings have always been bent to run away from our pain. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons people are terrified of silence in general is it will force you to face reality, the reality of your life. Uh, the good and the bad and the ugly. It will force you to face your pain. Like I was doing a a kind of a man night with my two sons and some other young guys from our church, and we were just kind of doing a campfire together. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking for like man conversation questions. And so I did the, okay, guys, what's your deepest fear? You know, we started going around the circle. What's your That's a great question, I Mm -hmm. think. So my 16-year-old son, who's more like your personality, is extroverted mm-hmm. as they come, super active kind of guy, he said, my deepest fear is silence and solitude. I'm absolutely wow. terrified of what would happen to me in that space. Wow. And I thought, that's pretty articulate and pretty honest, and I think he's probably speaking for a lot of people. So I think from time immemorial, human beings have looked for coping mechanisms and cultural narcotics to numb their pain or escape their pain or bypass their pain, where, uh, and often Christians then just use Christian spirituality as a pain coping mechanism to deny reality rather than face it with Jesus and heal Mm -hmm. through it. So, you know, this whole concept of spiritual bypassing, Mm -hmm. where you use like, quote God, it's not actually God, it's your perception of God to like try to just skip over your family wounds or your pain or your failure or your guilt or your shame. And so it's so funny how we, our sin just corrupts everything. So we'll even use prayer to escape reality rather than to move more deeply into reality. So I think there's a human thing there that then is just massively exacerbated before we even get to the iPhone, just through urbanization, like Susan Cain, and, you know, it's a tragedy when people think of people, I have to disclaimer this, when people think of solitude as like spirituality for introverts, mm-hmm. it's just as tragic as when people think of community as spirituality for extroverts. The reality is we, go, no matter where you fall on the introvert, yeah. extrovert spectrum, whether you're a higher introvert like me or a higher extrovert like you, we need both. And even if we gravitate toward one or the other and experience them differently emotionally, we need them both spiritually. But, uh, so it's a tragedy when people think of solitude as an introvert thing. But Susan Cain, not a Christian, in her book on introversion, which is a beautiful book, Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, just writes about the history of what she calls the extroverted ideal Hmm. and how historically in agrarian cultures up to the Industrial Revolution, people were less extroverted and more comfortable with quiet, with silence, and with deep relationships. But with industrialization, say 100, 150 years ago, as people began to move into cities, first off, you went to living by total strangers, what you and I consider normal. Right. You know, Even if you're not in a city, you're in a suburban context, you're surrounded by all these people you've never even met. Most people don't even know their neighbors anymore. Yeah, so that, Sebastian Younger in his book, Tribe, talks yes, about that. Yes, the same that. thing, early American. Where, yeah, and that... If you live in a suburban or urban context in the West today, you interact with people constantly, almost all of whom are strangers strangers to you and you're strangers to them. And you present differently to them. Yeah, and the early data psychologically is that that is wildly damaging to the human person. Yes. And then she writes about how the economy began to change and it required what she calls the extroverted ideal 
Mm -hmm. So whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, you live in an extrovert's world. So if you live in the Western kind of modern urban metropolitan, unless if you're a farmer or something, you live in a world where you have to like, hey, how's it going? Great to see you. Mm -hmm. Be confident, da, 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 which some people do really well in. Other people don't. And so she just writes about how, and it's all to do with urbanization, with the market, with, you know, if you're a farmer, you don't need great, necessarily need the same level of social skills. If you're in sales, then you need to be able to schmooze up and like mm -hmm. make great relationships right off the bat. So there's this whole thing that's been happening in our culture where been, people have been moving away from silence into a world of noise and where already you had this human propensity to run from the quiet place, from the deep places. And then of course, technology interrupts not another layer, it's like a bomb on top of that, where now we have this digital appendage to our lives that is intentionally designed to consume every waking moment, every little scrap of free time you have that used to be given over to things like prayer or even just a reflective life when you were just bored at a stoplight in your car or you're stuck in the elevator or you're waiting in line for the plane to board. All of those moments were like little portals to come back to God mm -hmm. and to yourself. And now pretty much all of those moments have been swallowed up by text messaging and Twitter and whatever, you know? Yeah. I, so I think it's like a, it's an ancient human problem that's massively exacerbated. Mm -hmm. I, I have an interesting reflection on this as someone who uh, it is more on the extrovert side of the spectrum. So when I first began, and, and I think I'm someone who's always been an intercessor naturally yes. that's like a spiritual pathway between yes. me and jesus and so when i was first introduced to solitude and silence i began to practice it regularly like every morning a couple of minutes you know yes and i didn't like it i i wanted to do more active spiritual practices with jesus and uh occasionally i would there would be like some great insight or moment of revelation but it was few and far between. It was like 10% or less of the time. And, and and when that wasn't the case, it felt like that was a waste or I didn't do it right or something like that. But how I began to experience it over time is a return to my naked and unashamed self. Yes. Because I have the personality type that leans toward performance mm -hmm. and silence strips you of all of that, right? Yeah. There's no one for me to tell. I can't even perform to God. I can't do my spiritual practices to God. I just am. am before God. Yeah, and and I am. And you can't perform to yourself. Right, and, and so I'm used to doing all that in my personality. Then I also happen to be a pastor. So a lot <laughs> you of my- You get paid to do it? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I just mean a lot of my work is like, in, in a dysfunctional view for God. Yes. And so when I'm silent before him, I just am. And I can be loved by him. And I think I can return maybe as close as I get right now to being aware of my belovedness before yeah. him is in solitude and silence. And then I've noticed this about myself. I think it's good and it sometimes worries me that I'm just getting old, you know, but I've noticed that I used to fill my life with noise like my commutes my I would audiobooks music whatever I just was and now I so rarely hit play on anything just every time that I'm cycling somewhere on my commute if I'm in the car most of the time I just roll the windows down if I can if the weather's good enough and I just am quiet but I find a desire to return to quiet um lives in me now yeah. that didn't before yeah yeah and that's where understanding quiet like community because i would tell a very similar story about my journey into community yeah. which came later for me and first was not very fun but now it was like this intro i can't imagine my life with jesus without it and uh you know coming from a different personality structure but i think you begin to find solitude as the place where we most deeply experience the love and truth of God. Mm -hmm. And then you begin to crave, it's not silence that you crave though. I mean, maybe an introvert you are, or maybe there's, you know, there are aspects of, I think the human soul and even the brain that are built for non-stimulation at periods. But you begin to just crave those moments with the Trinity, mm -hmm. you know, and 
we all experience God in our own unique ways. Gary Thomas has that whole idea of spiritual pathways, mm -hmm. almost like a spiritual personality test. You know what I mean? Like they're just different. There are ways for me that I just come alive in God and other ways that other people come alive in God that for, for me are much more of a discipline. Um, but I think regardless of what your personality is, there is something happening as it does around a table in community. There's something happening in the quiet that we are just experiencing union with the Trinity. Yeah, and, and everyone who's ever then spoken verbal prayers has had the experience of like trying to think of things to talk to God about mm -hmm. and the experience where pl prayers flowing out of me. Yeah. And some people call that praying in the spirit and some people mean different things when they say praying in the spirit, but where it's like, oh, there's this open faucet. of, And to me, solitude and silence is often the place that those prayers begin to flow from. When I am experiencing myself as beloved before him, then prayer begins to flow out of me more naturally. So look, you... you and there are different types of prayers that I think work better in different settings. Like mm -hmm. for me intercession, nine times out of 10, I wanna do it with other people. Mm -hmm. Like if there's something in my life where I feel like the spirit of Jesus is leading me to co-labor with him to see something, I, I don't like to do that in the quiet of the early morning with my cup of coffee. I like to do that with other people, mm -hmm. like out loud, standing up, my arms in the air, praying yeah. to Jesus. Not that you can't do intercession alone, you no, know. No, I do it alone um, with the yeah. cup of. I do exactly what you said you don't like to do. But yeah. <laughs> but uh, but there, there's a type of prayer that is less about trying to change what is and more about trying to surrender to God in what is. Yes. And that I far prefer to do alone. Yeah. So, what about for someone that's just looking for a place to start? W where would you suggest someone begin when it comes to stillness before the Lord? Well, I think, you know, we're embodied beings and you've said some really great things about this lately. I think, what did you say? We're, we have an embodied faith and a wandering mind, I think you said recently. And I think we need to take the body as seriously as possible as we present our whole self before God. So there's not a right way. There's not a wrong way. There's not a technique. I mean, I love the Rollheiser line. Like, the only rule of prayer is show up, show up and, <laughs> and just, up. And just yeah. show up regularly. Yeah. It's the only rule. There's, there's no way to be good at it or bad at it to succeed or fail. Just show up and show up regularly. But, um, and maybe this will be more true for personality types like mine than others, but I find stillness to be so incredibly difficult at an, as an inner state to reach. Mm -hmm. So finding ways to get into an embodied stillness that helps cue me, and there's all the science now but behind habits and like the power of cues. Yeah. You know, and this whole like multi million so dollar when advertising agency. You get agencies. in a certain posture, it cues your. Yes. Back. And so it's why there's certain, th like, there's all these things that trigger your nervous system based on memory and all this complex neuroscience I could not explain that advertisers are currently trying to manipulate that just cue us to certain behaviors. So I think building a kind of habit or ritual or whatever you want to call it, structure for your body that helps lead you into the presence of God and into stillness is really important. So for me, and this will not work for certain people or it will not be helpful for others, but for me, doing it first thing in the morning is by far the best time because I'm just, by the end of the day, my brain is just mush. Mm -hmm. And so any kind of like directed attention form of prayer is very difficult for me at night. And in the middle of the day, I'm so task oriented that stillness kind of prayer is really hard for me to get to because I'm so in, I'm just a very task oriented personality. And so it's really hard to like click out of that into kind of a resting form of prayer, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying it and I'm learning, but that morning hour for me, and I'm not even a big morning person, but a morning hour, it's very important to me to give my conscious attention to God, if at all possible, before anything else. No phone, no work, no email, no news. The only thing that can interrupt that time is basically my children or my wife and if they need me, you know? And, um, and so a dedicated time, and then I create like little rituals to kind of mark that time. Like for me, you know, making coffee in the morning, I have my little Chemex set up yeah. and I'm trying to turn it into like this little like way to like begin to, you know, center myself. I have a couple of 
uh, things I recite, like Psalm 23, just on my pillow before I get out of bed. Super mm-hmm. simple, simple, simple stuff. I'm barely awake, you know, mm-hmm. but just trying to recite, to recite Psalm 23. First thing, once I am awake, lie on my back before I climb out of the bed. Yeah. And um, and then things like posture are really helpful for me. Like I prayed for years on a couch, you know, uh, and I recently just started sitting on the floor with my legs crossed, with my chest kind of up, and so I can breathe really deeply. And it has been so helpful. Like it's the silliest little thing, and it has like enriched my prayer life so much. I find mm-hmm. it so much easier to pay attention to God, to attune to God, to calm to God. Just that change to kind of sitting up with my shoulders back and you know and it kind of I can only sit that way for so long Mm -hmm. so it kind of like keeps my mind from wandering it keeps me praying because I know at some point I'm 42 and my back's hurting too bad (laughs) and I gotta get up (laughs) and I'm like all right I think we're done praying for the morning I think Mm -hmm. that's it so um yeah so I think some of those embodied rituals I find very helpful but again this goes to personalities some personality types spontaneity and Creativity is really important for them. So doing a different thing every single day would be really meaningful. I'm going to go for a walk one day. I'm going to paint and draw another day. I'm going to say a liturgy another day. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, But I find silence so wildly interesting with God Mm -hmm. that I'm trying to, like, make my bodily postures around silence very staid because what I experience in that place of silence is so fascinating and different, and I'm not in control of it, what's happening with God and prayer. So it's kind of like, you know, a lot of the great artists are like the opposite of into fashion. A lot of the most famous fashion designers in the world just wear black t-shirt and black jeans every single day. Hmm. You know, a lot of the great artists and designers and musicians wear the same outfit every day. And it's not because they're not creative or they're boring, it's because they're actually opening up more space in their life for creativity. And they're just saying, I don't want my creativity to go to what outfit I'm wearing today. I want it to go to what song I'm writing or what, you know. And so I think in a little way for prayer, I put these kind of pretty pretty strong rituals around my prayer time because what I experience in the silence with God is like the opposite of boredom. Mm. I just, I personally, I don't know if that's me or what, I just find it to be this weird mixture of so calm but fascinating. Yeah, and, you know, I think I would, the only thing I would add is if there's someone that's just starting out, I would say rhythm is more important than duration. Yeah. So so if it if spending a half hour in silence sounds like a nightmare, then just go for a minute. Yeah, you know? go for five, but, go for two. But yeah. do that daily or regularly to cultivate a rhythm. In my experience, is if you give God a little bit of space to work with, He'll take. He'll work with the space, and then yeah, it, it, He will grow an appetite for Him in your inner life, and it don't you to reach for more. And I think one of the things is you know we can't yes to that. Like I'm thinking of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount when the first thing He said about how to pray was not about what to pray, but where to pray and how. Go mm-hmm. into your closet mm-hmm. and close the door. Um, so His first thing is like find a place. Mm-hmm. Like and this was a like an old school closet, like a pantry, you know. Yeah. And go find a place, get alone with God. But don't I think it's really important to not judge and evaluate your experience. Yes. So certain personalities will do this and they'll feel like I did a bad job or a good job, more kind of rule oriented, perfectionist personalities like me. Other personalities will will judge it like, did I like it or not like it? Mm-hmm. Did I enjoy, was it fun or not? Did I experience God or not? More kind of fun living. Right. That's really not all that helpful necessarily either. So I think more thinking of it as I'm just giving this moment to God as an act of love. Yes. It's like, you know, when we say to our wives, sorry, that sounded weird. When you say to your wife, I say to <laughs> <Yeah>. my wife. <laughs> yeah, it's not a group situation. I love you. I'm not giving her new information. She's right. heard that a thousand times. But there is something about saying that sentence that is participating in an act of love. Yeah. And I, you know what I mean? It's it's an active, it's just a phrase that I've said a thousand times. It doesn't have much meaning anymore, but it is still an act of love toward her. And so I think whether it's a minute or five minutes or 20 minutes, having a time of silence in the morning, you may love it, you may hate it. 
You may feel close to God. You may just feel your mind go a thousand different directions. Welcome to being human. You may feel like you're really good at it. You may just feel like this is ridiculous. I don't even know if I'm a Christian. But just view it as I'm just offering this to God in love. And if it's an act of love, then the quality of the experience, all those factors you mentioned suddenly aren't the defining thing. Right. And one of the things you learn about prayer, especially this type of prayer, whether you want to call it be still prayer, silent prayer, contemplative prayer, is different than like intercession. You're not so much trying to get things done out there in the world, which is important, very important. It's a very good place. You're trying to let God get things done in here, yes. in you, to become somebody who can go out into the world. Yes. So it's less about what you do and more about what God is doing in you in order to do through you. So it's less about control and more about surrender, less about performance and definitely not about performance and more about just love and offering. And I mean, that's so it's all about just letting that stuff go mm -hmm. in God's presence. And that I think when I think about contemplative prayer, which means different things to different people in different times in church history, I just understand it as looking at God, looking at me in love. Yes. And that's, that's all it is. And that's so key, you saying the, the ultimate aim, because at the end of the day, this is not about having a really good practice of contemplative prayer. At the end of the day, it's about becoming someone who can lovingly sit with another and be fully present to them. Um, undistracted. It's about becoming someone who can notice a stranger with compassion in your heart for them. It's becoming someone who is intentional and interruptible as Jesus was as he went throughout his life. And all of that can grow up in you through a simple practice of stillness. Yeah. And if Jesus needed it, I was reading this morning, coming into this time, kind of prepping for our time, and I happen to be reading Richard Foster's book on prayer at the same time as yours, which is wonderful. And he said this throwaway line. He's like, if Jesus needed silent prayer, we probably need it too, regardless of our personality type. Hmm. <laughs> and, the, I, and the point there isn't an ought or a should. It's, I think, when the disciples said to Jesus, teach us to pray, which is an extraordinary moment. It's the one time they say, teach us to do something. And they don't say, teach us to heal the sick. Mm -hmm. teach us to cast out demons, teach us to preach the gospel, teach us to draw a crowd of 30,000 people who go for three days without eating, teach us how to overturn injustice. Those are all incredible things that Jesus did. They say, teach us to pray. And I don't know, this is reading between the lines, but my theory is that they must have discerned that this extraordinary outer life and work of Jesus, all of this stuff, was somehow coming from the way that he was living in this extraordinary deep inner connection to the Father. Mm -hmm. And out of this place, something was happening with Jesus when he disappeared early in the morning and went away to mountains and was off a stone's throw away in the garden. Something was happening with him and the God that he called Father, out of which this extraordinary life was being lived. And I think um, Jesus was definitely not a monk. He wasn't, a, he wasn't even a desert father or mother, and we both love those people. Yeah. Jesus was an active person. Yes. And I don't know if he was an introvert or an extrovert or how that even applies. I'm sure he was an ambivert, whatever, yeah. however that applies. I don't know. But he was an extraordinarily active person, but with the deep kind of rhythm of quiet, contemplative spirituality that it just seems like was the wellspring of this life. So that I think that... We're all going to have to move our own way. You know, I'm having to move to, more toward action because mm -hmm. uh, I would love to just read books and think all of the time. Mm -hmm. Other people are going to have to move more towards silence and mm -hmm. reflection. But I think there's something in this Jesus paradigm, the deep inner life with the Father, out of which a life of love and service flow. That I think there's something there that that's what we're trying to learn as disciples of Jesus. Well said. <laughs>